Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, greetings, wherever you are and in whatever time zone you may be. My name is Atalia Omer, and I'm a professor of religion, conflict, and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. I am also a senior fellow with the Harvard Divinity School's Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative, where my esteemed colleagues are Professor Diane Moore and Hilary Rantisi. The Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative is hosting this event. Many thanks to Rima Tassi and Navi Hardin for a lot of logistics and hard work behind the scene. I want to start with a few brief words about the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative. A part of the new Religion and Public Life program, the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative centralizes an analysis of structural injustice, violence, and power, and examines how a more capacious understanding of religion can yield fresh insights into contemporary challenges and opportunities for justice-oriented peace building. The primary case study we are focusing on is that of Palestine, Israel. Our aim is to stretch the scholarly discourse around religion and the practices of peace building and examine the decolonial potentialities of art, religion, and identity transformation through rewriting social and political and religious scripts. With this framing in mind, and also with an acute awareness that the outcome of the elections held today in Israel, the fourth in two years, will likely result in the most extreme ethno-religious centric coalition in Israel's history. Nevertheless, we are going to hold a wonderful conversation today. Rabbi Brent Rosen has been in the past year a topple fellow in conflict and peace with us here at the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative at Harvard. Rabbi Rosen is the founder of Tzedek Chicago, a non-Zionist Jewish congregation based on the core values of justice, anti-racism and solidarity with the oppressed including Palestinians. The event today, as we are approaching quickly, the Jewish holiday of Pesach or Passover, emerges out of his fellowships project, which involves writing a book of new Jewish prayers, which reimagine Jewish liturgy through values of liberation, the prophetic imperative to speak truth to power, and a diaspora-based vision that interprets the entire world as the Jewish homeland. Rabbi Rosen will engage here in a conversation with the most fitting and perfect interlocutor. Professor Susanna Heschel is the LEM Black Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies at Dartmouth College, where she is also the chair of the Jewish Studies Department. In her numerous publications, she has intervened in multiple scholarly conversations, including the modern history of Jewish and Protestant thought, the history of anti-Semitism and Jewish feminist ethics. Those of you who registered in advance may have had a chance to read two short documents, one by Rabbi Rosen titled Toward the Judaism Beyond Zionism, <clears throat> and the other an essay by Professor Heschel published recently on the Contending Modernities blog based at the University of Notre Dame entitled Ending Exile with the Prophetic Voice of the Diasporic Jew. These documents just offer a bit of a background to the structure of the conversation that is about to unfold here. Let us now proceed, but before we do, I wanted to acknowledge my presence here in South Bend, Indiana, on the traditional homelands of native peoples, particularly the Pokeg and Potawatomi, who have been using this land for education for thousands of years and continue to do so. So uh, let us begin with, um, uh, uh, and maybe I should invite the participants to turn on their camera so that <laughs> I'll not speak to darkness. Um, all right, so let, let's start with um, uh, Rabbi Rosen. Um, and I would like to invite you to explain what led you to your effort to reimagine Jewish liturgy through an anti-militarist, emancipatory, post-nationalist and Palestine solidarity prisons. Where did the need come from? Can, and also, can you offer specific examples of your poetic and liturgical innovations and 
and share with us a bit about your, the, your interpretive process uh, that you employ in rewriting Jewish communal meanings. Thank you, Atalia. And uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, express my gratitude uh, for being able to be part of this uh, session, uh, particularly to the Religion, Conflict and Peace Initiative at Harvard. And it's been, uh, it's been such an important place for me uh, this past year. Uh, it's support of my work, uh, getting to know the other members of the fellowship has been a really tremendous experience uh, for me and led to all kinds of areas I never would have dreamed of uh, as I began to do this work. Um, and so thank you to, uh, to Atalia. I'm also just so pleased to be able to be uh, sharing this uh, webinar with Susanna as well. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, we founded SEDEC Chicago in the spring of 2015. So we're in the middle of our sixth year. And we founded the congregation really, uh, I think for some, uh, just a very basic reason. It was uh, originally intended to be a congregation for Jews who did not consider themselves to be Zionist or who consider themselves to be actively anti-Zionist. Uh, just about every liberal Jewish congregation uh, in the country, in the United States and North America is what I would call Zionist by default uh, in many, many different ways. It's manifest in many different ways. And we can talk more about that if people are interested. Uh, but. For people who, for whom this was not just a matter of, uh, of style or, or taste or opinion, but for whom we were really not uh, willing to, to participate in a, in a fusing of Jewish spiritual tradition with a settler colonial enterprise, uh, with an ethno-national uh, political project, it felt like there was just no place for us. And so together with a number of people who were members of my previous congregation in Evanston, Illinois, and others uh, in the community, people who we, we knew one another who had never really been part of a congregation for this reason, we founded SEDEC Chicago. And we did that with uh, initially by cr crafting these core values to which you alluded, Italia. Uh, we wanted to be very clear before we, uh, recruited our first member before our first member uh, joined the congregation that we were very, very clear uh, that we were an intentional community. Uh, so it was very clear that our, our approach to uh, being non-Zionist, our, our status of being non-Zionist was part of a larger anti-militarist, anti-colonial, anti-racist uh, frame for our congregation. So early on, we really began to realize that it wasn't enough to simply say we're not Zionist. Um, and we began to explore almost from the outset what that would really mean in a religious congregational context. Uh, and also uh, many, uh, many of the people in the congregation are active in the Palestine solidarity movement and had a political outlet for this work. So if standing in solidarity with Palestinians as a Jew was something more than simply a political issue, but really something we understood as a religious imperative, we needed to explore what that meant. Uh, and so that's when the, the liturgical aspect uh, began to emerge. It, it was manifest in many different ways, but in terms of the prayers that uh, I began to craft, uh, it became clear to me that Zionism has left an imprint on Jewish liturgy in, in lots of direct ways and lots of indirect ways. And in order to be true to the core values uh, that we espoused, uh, the approach to liturgy became something that became very, very important uh, for me in particular. I've long been writing um, creative Jewish liturgy for a long time. I did it in, in my former congregations as well not because I necessarily fancied myself as a, as a poet or liturgist, but really because it began out of just a necessity that uh, when it came to creative liturgy, there was some wonderful work out there, but it, you know, I reached a point where uh, if I wanted really what the kind of prayer that I wanted to express, it became clear to me I needed to write them myself. And so it was really kind of a utilitarian, uh, utilitarian approach. So, 
there are many different ways that this is manifest in the liturgy that we've been using in the congregation. Uh, it's the, the liturgy that I'm referring to has largely been in English, although there have been some examples of it in Hebrew as well. And uh, I think maybe the best way for me to, uh, to explain my approach and the way that these values, these core values are expressed through these prayers is to share a few of them with you. So uh, the first one I want to share uh, is, uh, since, uh, as you mentioned, Natalia, that the, the holiday of Pesach, of Passover, is coming up uh, beginning this weekend, I thought I would share a, a prayer that I wrote uh, several years ago uh, for, for use on Pesach. And it's a, just to give you a little bit of an introduction, it's a, uh, a version uh, from the Haggadah that has to do with children asking questions. In the Torah, it mentions at the very first commandment to keep the Seder in Egypt before the Exodus, that uh, God says to Moses and the Israelites that you're, when your child asks, what is the meaning of this, you will explain to them. And that became, in many ways, the foundation for the, the Seder experience writ large, that uh, it is really a series of questions. So I will share my screen now with you. Um, and this is a, a prayer entitled, Your Child Will Ask. Your child will ask, why do we observe this festival? And you will answer, it is because of what God did for us when we were set free from the land of Egypt. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt that we might hold tightly to the pain of our enslavement with a mighty hand? And you will answer, we were set free from Egypt that we might release our pain by reaching with an outstretched arm to all who struggle for freedom. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt because we are God's chosen people? And you will answer, we were set free from the land of Egypt so that we will finally come to learn all who are oppressed are God's chosen. Your child will ask, were we set free from the land of Egypt that we might conquer and settle a land inhabited by others? And you will answer, we were set free from the land of Egypt that we might open wide the doors to proclaim, let all who are dispossessed return home. Let all who wander find welcome at the table. Let all who hunger for liberation come and eat. And just to give you a little bit of a background of some of the, the imagery here, uh, the first question really comes directly from the Torah. Uh, you will answer it is because of what God did for us when we were set free from the land of Egypt. And then I uh, expanded outward, um, really going from the, as you can probably sense, from the particular to the universal. And uh, our universalism is, is a very important part of the core values of our congregation. That. Um, we do not understand these rituals uh, and these prayers and really Jewish tradition as a whole uh, to only be about us. Uh, and particularly when we talk about the core uh, narrative of liberation, uh, that we use our narrative of liberation as a way of expanding outward to understand our solidarity with all who seek liberation. Uh, the, the reference to holding on to the pain of our enslavement with a mighty hand, really is a um, maybe not so uh, oblique reference to the ways in which uh, Israeli society in particular is um, a traumatized society. And the way that trauma is manifest is often uh, uh, in, in many different ways, but, but often uh, is manifest through uh, the oppression of the Palestinian people, um, projecting our trauma outward. Um, the use of the image of the outstretched arm, but here really understanding God as being manifest through uh, God's outstretched arm being uh, manifest through our stretching our arms out and reaching out to and joining together with all who struggle for freedom. Um, the idea of uh, that all who are oppressed are God's chosen. Uh, some of that comes from my background as a Reconstructionist Jew uh, and Reconstructionist Judaism, which was founded by Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, has been uh, famous and some might say notorious for rejecting the idea of Jews as somehow God's elect or God's chosen. Uh, but here I wanted to play with the idea that, um, that if we're looking at a liberatory approach and we're looking to lift up 
the narrative of liberation uh, for Jews and all people to understand that all who uh, are oppressed people are God's chosen. And then um, a, very, uh, a very direct reference to not only uh, what's going on in Israel-Palestine, but uh, this, final, this final question really was my attempt to um, reckon with the conquest tradition in the Torah, because the Exodus story is not only about the Exodus from Egypt, it's about the Exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt so that they may go into a land, dispossess its inhabitants of uh, the Canaanites of the land uh, and settle it uh, through the command of God. So this uh, is really a, an attempt to begin a conversation of how we might reckon with this conquest tradition, which is an integral part of the Exodus narrative, uh, but also clearly um, making that uh, as a reference to, um, to the reality of Israel-Palestine today that the so-called liberation of the Jewish people, as uh, the Zionist narrative would have it, uh, came through the dispossession of the people who lived in that land uh, before. So that's uh, one example. And I will share now another prayer. And this is uh, a prayer for Nakba Day. Uh, so one of the ways that congregations, um, as I mentioned before, are Zionist by default is that uh, many holidays, which uh, are really Israeli holidays, holidays that were instituted by, uh, by Israel after its founding in 1948, uh, have become a very regular part of the American Jewish uh, religious calendar. So in particular, uh, Yom Hatzma'ut, uh, Israeli Independence Day, is, uh, is a regular part of American Jewish ritual along with our ancient festivals. Uh, Yom Hazikaron, Israeli Memorial Day, is another example of that. So uh, rather than understanding the founding of the State of Israel in, as, uh, as a form of redemption for the, uh, for the uh, Jewish people, uh, we understand uh, this, as I mentioned before, as coming, at, uh, uh, coming on, on top of those who were living in the land previously the Palestinian people and Nakba day, Nakba being the day that Palestinians referred to as the day of their catastrophe of their dispossession. Uh, we feel that it's important to mark this time not as a redemptive liber liberative time for the Jewish people, but rather a time to reckon with the meaning of this dispossession, um, both in terms of us understanding it, understanding the history of it, um, being honest about that, but also uh, bringing in the concept of tshuva, of, uh, of Jewish repentance, and ultimately pointing toward reconciliation, that that is really the meaning of this time um, for, for the Jewish people. So this prayer that I wrote is a Jewish prayer for Nakba Day. I'll read it first and then unpack it. L'el shachafetz tshuva to the one who desires return, Receive with the fullness of your mercy the hopes and prayers of those who were uprooted, dispossessed, and expelled from their homes during the devastation of the Nakba. Sanctify for tov uvracha, for goodness and blessing, the memory of those who were killed in Lida, in Haifa, in Besan, in Der Yassin, and so many other villages and cities throughout Palestine. Grant chesed verachamim, kindness and compassion upon the memory of the expelled who died from hunger, thirst, and exhaustion along the way. Shelter beneath kanfei hashchina, the soft wings of your divine presence, those who still live under military occupation, who dwell in refugee camps, those dispersed throughout the world still dreaming of return. Gather them, may our ba kanfota aretz, from the four corners of the earth, that their right to return to their homes be honored at long last. Let all who dwell in the land live in dignity, equity, and hope, so that they may bequeath to their children a future of justice and peace. Vinomar, and let us say, Amen. Le'el shachafetz tshuva, to the one who desires repentance. Inspire us to make a full accounting of the wrongdoing that was committed in our name. Help us to face the terrible truth of the Nakba and its ongoing injustice, that we may finally confess our offenses, that we may finally move toward a future of reparation and reconciliation. 
l'el malei rachamim, to the one filled with compassion. Show us how to understand the pain that compelled our people to inflict such suffering upon another, dispossessing families from their homes in the vain hope of safety and security for our own. O say hashalom, maker of peace, guide us all toward a place of healing and wholeness, that the land may be filled with the sounds of joy and gladness from the river to the sea speedily in our day in Omar and let us say amen. So just briefly, uh, this prayer uses many traditional Jewish images and uh, references to theological references. Uh, but the main uh, frame that I used in this prayer is the concept of tshuva and tshuva uh, literally means return, but it's also the word that Jews use for uh, repentance and atonement, particularly on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, tshuva is a, cent a central, uh, central guiding theme of the holiday. So what I did with this prayer was really played with the two sides of tshuva. Um, in the first half of the prayer, tshuva referring to uh, the desire of, of return for the Palestinian people, and tshuva in the second half of the prayer for the Jewish people, uh, focusing on the concept of, of atonement, of uh, our, as I said before, reckoning with the, uh, with the meaning of this dispossession. And as I said before, this is a prayer that we uh, at Zedek Chicago pray, um, while many in the Jewish world um, are, are celebrating Yom Hatzma'ut as an Independence Day, as a day of um, really almost religious understanding of, of redemption of the Jewish people, we understand it in a decidedly different way. So I'll stop there. There's much more to say, but um, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Atalia. Great. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, a lot is already on the table. And I would like to turn now to um, uh, Professor Heschel um, and um, uh, to invite you to speak well, to respond to whatever you want to respond, but also I was thinking specifically of um, uh, the essay that you recently authored that I mentioned earlier, where you write, religion is not a series of proposition, nor a social order that creates community through ritual performance. Religion demands affect, emotional commitment, and stirs the basic human need for engagement with other human beings, end of quote. So I wonder if you could um, elaborate on this intervention that you are making here in terms of understanding the kind of the decolonial move as offering glimpses of prophetic pathways. Uh, and to the degree to which you see your position is similar to, to Brent's position um, and perhaps identify where you see divergences. So the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Natalia, for organizing our conversation today. And Brent, it's great to be with you. Um, I very much appreciate what you just spoke about, Brent. Uh, I, I would just say that one of the nice things about what you're doing with Passover is that you're shifting the Seder from what Israel and Yuval has described as an anti-Christian polemic uh, to something that is far more Jewishly oriented. And I appreciate that, uh, that the, the Haggadah shouldn't just be a polemic against certain Christian claims that when we hold up the matzah, we say halach ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction. You Christians who say this is the body of Christ, you're wrong, we're right. That kind of polemic, it's nice to move away from that. So thank you for that. Uh, I think in terms of what has happened in, 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 as what you've called the, the Zionization of Judaism in America as well, is seen visually also in the Israeli flag at the front of the synagogue, uh, along with the American flag. I don't know why flags are there anyway. That strikes me as inappropriate on the contrary. And I'll say a word about why. But it's also in the in the day schools nowadays, it, traditionally, when you study, when a child went to Cheder and began to learn Torah, they began with Vayikra, with Leviticus. And now they're starting with Joshua. And I saw that with my children, went to Solomon Schechter, and I realized why. Because it's a militaristic conquest of the land of Canaan. And I was just shocked. They didn't begin with Genesis, with Exodus, but with Joshua. So that's an example of it. And Rachel Haverlock has a new book in which she talks about that. So those are just some of the ways that, in, you're right, our, our Judaism has been turned into 
a kind of extension of, of Israel, Zionization, however you want to call. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I come come to uh, I come to this question perhaps from a slightly different angle, uh, and that is having been influenced by Atalia's work, uh, Atalia Omer's work, and also by the work of, of Santiago Slobodsky. Uh, and the question for me has been, you know, we talk about liberation from Egypt and then going into exile. And exile is something that every Jew hears all the time. We lived in exile until 1948. And I don't know who started this, but, <laughs> but of course we haven't been. That is, the Romans never issued an edict of exile. Jews remained in the land of Israel. They wrote a Talmud there. They wrote Midrashim there. No one exiled us. So what are we talking about? So it turns out that the idea of being in exile was something that developed around the fifth century and primarily in relation to the Babylonians of the sixth century BCE to that conquest. But there was no edict of exile. Jews have lived in that land. But the vast majority of them, even in the year 70 CE, when the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem, there were so many Jews living all over the world at that point, living in Egypt and Alexandria and Elephantine and Rome and Babylonia, certainly. One of my students recently was so sweet, was so shocked at all we had done in Babylonian exile. And I said, why isn't that our, our homeland? <laughs> <laughs> That's Iraq today. I'm, I just loved his expression, his amazement at that. So yes, we were in Babylonia, and that's where we, we wrote the Talmud, and it's in the Babylonian Talmud, the rabbi sitting in Babylonia saying the only place for Jew to be is in the land of Israel. What, what do you mean? You're in Babylonia. Why are you saying this? So first of all, we have this myth of having been in exile, and what has that done to us? It has no political basis. But it has taken on a kind of a sense of identity, has a lot of affect associated with it. It's a way for Jews to feel lachrymose about Jewish history. And it's that internalization of a feeling of exile, the affect of it, that's very problematic. It's very problematic. And I actually would also say that those Zionist thinkers who thought that moving to the land of Israel and establishing a state would be a negation and an end of exile, they're wrong. And my father actually talks about this, that Israel itself is in Golis. What is Golis? What is exile? It means uh, on the day of, of in, on the celebration of Independence Day, when they have parades, they have tanks and, and jet fighters. That's Golis. What does that mean? It means where are the values? Where are the Jewish values? Precisely what you're talking about, Brand. What do we stand for? Do we stand for tanks and planes? What do we stand for? And so I, I First, Atalia's work, and then uh, Santiago's work. What I liked was the formulation. First of all, I very much appreciate Atalia demonstrating that religion has to be present for political purposes, that there is no divorce between the political and the religious. And she shows that very clearly. And you exemplify that too, Brad. And then Santiago comes and from, from South America, from Argentina, where there's a vital Jewish community, by the way, that nobody seems to pay much attention to, unfortunately. But he comes with this marvelous voice and talks about the global South. And he talks about all kinds of interesting thinkers in the global South that really need to be part of our conversation in Jewish thought. And he talks about a decolonial Judaism, meaning we in Jewish thought, whether we talk about Buber and Rosenzweig and Levinas and Moses Mendels and so on, there are all these European thinkers who are engaged with European, Western, Christian ideas, and either to refute Kant or to accept Hegel or whatever you want to do, it's time to get away from that. And he says, you know, what are these Europeans doing? They're colonizing the world. 85% of the landmass of Earth was under colonial domination by the First World War. So Santiago says, we as Jews, Instead of worrying about trying to talk about the Christians and the European, the West, let's instead identify with the barbarians. The barbarians, namely the people that were viewed as barbarians by this Christian Western imperialist mentality. Let's identify as Jews with those people and see where it leads us. Because in fact, Zionism has identified with the European Western notions of the imperial and the colonized and so forth by trying to take us 
we as Jews take ourselves out of having been colonized by the West, having been deprived of sovereignty and now establishing sovereignty, we've simply taken ourselves out of having been the victims of Christian supersessionism to be identifying with those supersessionists. So how can we then develop a Judaism that identifies with the so-called barbarians? And that's, that's what's interesting to me. And that's where I see our connections for the, the three of us. And I'd bring in Santiago as well. Yes, wonderful. And I hope Santiago is somewhere there in the um, <laughs> cyber audience and he's listening uh, to this conversation. Um, and I, I, I want to invite Brand to respond to whatever kind of um, uh, you know, generated <laughs> reaction for you um, in um, uh, Susanna's remarks and also ask you, uh, since I'm aware that we are actually, <laughs> we are very short in time, um, I would like to ask you to, um, um, to uh, speak a little bit about the degree to which reimagining Jewish liturgy as you've been engaging in um, um, and also reimagining re Jewish community and specifically American Jewish community uh, is relational uh, and directly connected to your to your sense or, or maybe unpack a little bit more since you 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 shared with us the the Nakba prayer, uh, your sense of Jewish complicity and atonement uh, and responsibility to what is done in your name. Uh, so it's not about, you know, injustice in general, but it's injustice that is specifically related to Jewish power. Uh, so I wanted, I want to invite you to, um, uh, to speak uh, a bit more about that and also um, uh, recognizing that one of the challenges of Jewish rescripting is to um, also disengage from um, kind of this Jewish assimilation into whiteness, which also relates to what Susanna just said. Um, and, and this also requires kind of an interrogation of the marginality of Jews of color um, and non-Ashkenazi Jews or non-European Jews. And so to what degree um, uh, such kind of intra-Jewish scrutiny is relevant for a liturgical and communal reconfiguration that, that you are a part of. You are one kind of author in that process of um, rescripting, uh, which relates to, um, to many of the points that Susanna kind of highlighted. Sure. So um, to Susanna's first point, you know, I, I think I've been thinking a great deal about um, this, you know, the lacrimose vision of, of Jewish history and, and what what this notion of exile does to us in a in a spiritual cellular kind of way. Uh, and I think Zionism really lifted that up in a very big way with their concept of Shlilat HaGalut, you know, that they saw the, 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 what they called negation of the exile, that they saw the diaspora as just a thoroughly inhospitable place for Jews to live, and that the only place uh, for Jews uh, to really fulfill their future as, as Jews, both physically and existentially, uh, was, was the land of Israel. Um, and I, I've been thinking a great deal, uh, too, about the idea of galut or exile versus the idea of diaspora, which I think are, are different. And I, I prefer to use the word diaspora, actually, and, and to think of what we're doing at Tzedek as is a diasporist approach to Judaism. You know, um, exile, as you, as you put it, Susanna, it implies that we are somehow cut off, that to be Jewish means to be cut off from our source. And, you know, the, it also means to be vulnerable. You know, the word galut comes from the, the, the verb that means exposed or open or vulnerable or naked. You know, um, it's the same word that was used to refer to Noah in the book of Genesis when uh, he was naked, you know, he passed out naked in his tent. Um, and that, so that has a certain connotation. The diaspora literally means scattered. I mean, it literally means we are of, of the world. And as you put it, you know, the world, Judaism as a, as a tradition really was born in the diaspora. It's an inherently diasporist uh, uh, approach to understanding our place. And, you know, Babylonia being uh, one of the many important foci of, of that world. And so I, I'm thinking a great deal about this concept of diaspora and understanding as, of diaspora as diaspora as homeland, paradoxically, you know, that um, one of the... The, the real beauties of Jewish tradition and Jewish life 
is that we are this multi-ethnic, multicultural, transnational people. And that's what's kept us alive, uh, which is in many ways so unique. Um, more recently, there's been studies in, in diaspora studies or diasporas of, of other peoples as well. And I think diasporas vary from uh, from people to people. And even within Judaism, I don't but, know if it's... Know, I, I want to interrupt for just a mm -hmm. second, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. So what I want to clarify is just one thing, which is that what I wrote for the blog that Atalia Omer edits called Contending Modernities. And what I distinguish there, and have a look at it when you have a minute, is between exile and diaspora is the following. I identified a diasporic position as the prophetic position. A prophet is not a sovereign by definition. And a prophet cannot be in exile or there is no real voice. There's a voice perhaps of lament, but not of a call of prophetic justice to the sovereign. So it's really only in the position of diaspora, that is one who is present, not in power, but also not excluded, but present. That is the position of the prophet. So that's how I understand diaspora. It's not about where you live or being integrated into a society. That's not really the point. The point is that diaspora has a moral meaning and a theological meaning for me. It is the prophetic position. Exile means you've just walked away from the whole thing. You're disengaged or you're disempowered. You have no voice, nothing. And it may be that the prophet speaks on behalf of those in exile. But that is why diaspora is important. That's the diasporic position, to be in the prophetic position. And so that means not simply uh, blending in to the background in the United States. When you write a prayer, Brant, about whether it's Passover or about the Nakba, you are taking a prophetic position. You're not in exile and you're also not in power. You're not in, you're not the sovereign. So that's my distinction. That's where it fits in. And I think it's very important for us as Jews to assume that position and not simply regard diaspora as the place of having fun in a multicultural setting. It means yeah. taking a certain responsibility politically. And, and maybe since we are just to stay uh, for a second on this uh, point, I, I, um, I would like to kind of hear from both of you, maybe um, um, uh, your, your thought with respect, with, with, with respect to the, the place of Zion, what is Zion within the mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, the Jewish liturgical imagination and uh, uh, um, uh, is it metaphorical? Is it concrete? Uh, and um, is it a, a place? What what is it? Um, and um, uh, and and if it is a metaphor, uh, to what degree um, it doesn't kind of uh, is uh, th that kind of process of metaphorization doesn't is not complicit with um, a supersessionist um, framework, and um, uh, and. Kind of a, a, a different side of this question is um, uh, just kind of echoing what uh, Susanna just said. Um, to what degree it, do you think it's possible for um, Jews in Israel, in that space, Palestine, Israel, to um, imagine their Jewishness as diasporist? Um, so, to, uh, to what degree the conversation is kind of by default outside of the space and what degree we can think about the space in relation to this conversation. So to both of you, this is the question. Yes. You know, and ask Brian, what would you would you have been comfortable with Martin Buber and Gershom Sholem and, and Bergman and others in the binationalist movement? You know, it's I think about that a great deal. And you know I it was such a different time and place. Uh, I think they were really responding to the the growth of Zionism and the movement toward a a ethnically Jewish state um, and with a specific political program. Um, you know, it, ironically, I think what they would be considered today would be anti-Zionist. Uh, what, what was called binationalist, you know, the Brit Sedek, the Brit Sedek folks, you know, due to Magnus and right. Uber and others, I think today they'd be probably um, drummed out of the Jewish community for their points of view. So, you know, I, 
I learn a great deal from them. I, I appreciate their point of view. They were in a very distinct minority, but they were an important minority. Um, you know, I think a great deal about Hannah Arendt's warnings before, on the eve of the, the establishment of the state saying, you know, Israel is going to become this Sparta in the Middle East, this Jewish Sparta in the Middle East. And it's amazing how prescient her words were. So, you know, I learn a great deal from them and I, I identify a great deal with what they're saying, but also aware that just so much has changed since since that time. Um, and I often think about what um, what they would what what they would be saying today. Um, I often think about what your father would be saying today. You know, it's the, the, um, the, the circumstances of the birth of, of the state of Israel uh, resulted in such huge dispossession, such massive dispossession of, of hundreds of thousands of people that was really kept uh, at bay in, the, in Jew, the Jewish world for a very long time. And that dam is starting to break now. So, um, you know, I also, I just wanted to, to say, I, I deeply appreciate your connection with the prophetic and the diaspora. Um, and I, I think it's a, that's a very important connection to be making. Um, I, I think within Israel, I know there are, I think there are Israelis that are um, prophetic in that way. You know, to Susanna's point that, you know, Israel is in many ways living in a kind of an, a Galut experience itself. I think speaking truth to power um, can happen in many different places, and it does happen in Israel. I think it's a, a, a very distinct and embattled minority, um, but there are Israeli Galut prophets, you know, or diaspora prophets, I would say. Um, just briefly to your, your question, Natalia, about Zion, you know, Zion is a very rich metaphor, um, and it's understood in many, many different ways. Um, you know, it's uh, it refers, yes, to a very specific place, Jerusalem, or even a mountain in Jerusalem, but it also, in the rabbinic imagination, refers to wisdom, it refers to the Jewish people. Uh, you know, Zion has taken on many, many different layers. And one of the things that the Zionist movement, when it began, it coined itself as Zionism, it really conflated all of those metaphors into a, the most specific literal physical meaning of that term. Um, and to both reclaim what Zionism could be as a metaphor, as you were saying, that Zion can, uh, you know, can exist anywhere as an idea. You know, the rabbis talked about Yerushalayim Shalmata and Yerushalayim Shalmala, that there's a, an earthly Ju Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem. And, um, you know, you might say that Zionism has become so fixated on Yerushalayim Shalmata that the notion of a of a more transcendent Zion, of a more uh, of a, a Zion that could exist wherever we might live uh, in the world, uh, um, wherever we are uh, speaking prophetically to power, as Susanna is suggesting, um, is uh, is something that we can and should be affirming. Um, so. I think all metaphors have their um, have their limits. I think this overemphasis on Zion, which is just one of many, many different images in Jewish tradition, can sometimes be self-defeating. Uh, but I've written prayers and written liturgies that talk about um, understanding uh, that and every, anywhere you live is can has the potential to be your Zion. Um, um, if we if we understand Zion as the most transcendent aspirations of uh, of liberation and justice in our world. Susanna, do you want to also speak to this point? Well, I, I suppose that would uh, leave us with the question of whether Zion should be retained as a metaphor for a messianic future. Mm. That is, does it have a role in a messianic future that is a future of justice for all? Uh, I personally am drawn to the binationalists. In other words, if Israel were a binational Jewish Arab state, with equality for all of its citizens, a democratic state, would I have a problem with it at that point? I don't think so. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. And in some sense, I think that with all the criticisms that we have of Israel and of the Zionist project, there are some simple things that can be done to correct. It's not a disaster. It can be corrected. In other words, I don't think it will be in our lifetime. 
But yep. yes, but Just, that's the question. So is Zion a metaphor for the future, for messianic future? Does it have a place? Does it evoke the kind of image of justice that we hope for? Or does it need to be detached from the prophet's dream of world peace? I would say messianic, not necessarily the way that the rabbis of old defined the messianic kingdom, but also not the, Mess the messianic world that the Zionist movement is trying to um, embody in political nationalism, but a different kind of messianism, as, as yeah. you're saying, you know, um, it, I just, I'm often struck that just the mere suggestion that everybody who lives between the river and the sea should be a citizen with equal rights is considered uh, heresy in, in the Jewish world, you know, in the organized Jewish world, that shows how um, far away from that messianic ideal we've, we've, we find ourselves. Um, to, uh, to your uh, question, um, Talia, about the intra-Jewish uh, communal conversation, uh, particularly around Jews of color, I think that's something that um, we're discovering very, very quickly is is a uh, is a voice that needs to be centered, um, and um, you know, I make no bones about that. You know, but I I I, find, I think that if we are going to understand the kind of uh, the kind of Jewish community that that Susanna and Santiago and others have been uh, have been uh, suggesting. Um, the the voices of Jews of color and Jews in the global south um, uh, have been kept out of the conversation um, for for far too long, and I think that that voice is absolutely essential. I mean, it needs to be it needs to be put front and center if this is uh, if this vision is going to get any kind of foothold for the future. Yeah, and I personally would also add, um, you know, the the kind of global south that exists in within the Israeli framework itself, and that includes also, you know, the inhabitants of South Tel Aviv, for instance, um, thinking about the experience of Arab Jews uh, and non-Ashkenazi Jews uh, within that broader kind of ideological framework, because often they are, you know, they they could be potential uh, allies uh, and uh, co-resistors. Um, and often are kind of precluded from thinking about uh, liber liberationist and emancipatory um, visions. So um, there are quite a few questions <laughs> lined up um, in the Q&A. Uh, one question, uh, which I think that was addressed, but I'm going to ask uh, nonetheless, just to make sure that um, uh, it uh, kind of it's conveyed, uh, is by Rabbi Salzman. Uh, who writes, these laments for the Nakba are strong, and I note that they lack a section about the sufferings too of Israelis. So the lit liturgy brings unbalance and lacks that universal yearning for shalom, wholeness for all. So um, Rabbi Rosen, do you want to respond to this? Yes, you know, um, I think, Part of my approach in that prayer was going on the assumption that uh, Israeli yearning and Israeli pain and Israeli uh, sense of suffering has uh, been foregrounded exclusively in the American Jewish community. And so on one level, I think by writing that prayer, I was attempting to rewrite that balance. Uh, but also you may remember that there was a reference in that prayer to our pain you know, to the, the, the pain of the Israeli people and, and the Jewish people, and that the tragedy of, uh, of our current situation, that the tragedy of Zionism is that, um, that we manifested our pain through inflicting pain on other people. Um, and that is also something that I don't think we reckon with in a serious way uh, in the in the American Jewish community. So if it feels unbalanced, yeah, I, I would I would cop to that to some extent. But it's really because I'm trying with this liturgy to uh, suggest uh, a recalibration of our understanding of what our moral responsibility needs to be. Great, and um, 
there is another question here from uh, Judith Bills who asks, um, who writes, uh, many social justice movements, civil rights, apartheid, anti-apartheid, I'm assuming um, um, are examples required a major moral reckoning and reorientation within powerful majority religious traditions. Do you draw lessons from that experience that informs how your work might have broader impact over time? I'm not sure I completely understand the question. I, I think that the question is about what, what other uh, maybe struggles mm -hmm. um, that deploy kind of um, um, religious and moral uh, reckoning, for instance, the anti-apartheid, mm -hmm. do you draw on and how? Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm... Yes, I mean, I, I, and this goes to what I was saying before about when we began the congregation, there was a sense that this was not just a political issue, but that this was a, a religious moral issue. Um, and, you know, we have people in our congregation who would otherwise define themselves as secular, but I think are drawn to the congregation because they, their sense of trying to engage with this issue has a needs a deeper outlet. So I, you know, I, I think it's clear that every, you know, every movement for liberation, I think, in human history on some level has, um, there's a religious, there's a religious component or foundation to it. The, the civil rights movement in this country would, would have been unthinkable without the role of the black church, for instance, um, or in, in South Africa, or, you know, in places around the world. I'm not saying it's a, you know, to, to somehow bifurcate religion as a separate category is problematic. But understanding as a Jew, um, the, the, the concept of struggle against oppression and liberation, not just uh, through a political lens, but through the lens of our most sacred story, the, ex the Exodus story, um, is, is something that comes very naturally. Um, and uh, so, yes, I, I, I have great respect for the religious dimension of liberation struggles throughout history. And on, on a, in a very real way, I think that's something we're trying to do in our congregation. Well, so many of those struggles for liberation have also picked up on the Exodus, and that's really quite remarkable. Uh, as Michael Walzer has shown and others, uh, I, I find that, um, I find that extraordinary and I find it unfortunate in certain countries that it didn't happen and I'm thinking of Germany here. Uh, I also would say that clearly, I mean, look, um, I don't know of a country whose government I like at the present time. In fact, I, I dislike, I would say, almost everybody who's in power at the moment. I'm trying to think of whether there are some, I guess New Zealand is becoming a favorite, but uh, I, I have to say that there is something a little bit um, just disingenuous that we sit here, Brant, you and I, as Americans, uh, and point the finger at Israel's dispossession when the United States rests on dispossession, genocide, and enslavement. Uh, so uh, who, who do we think we are? And are we using Israel, in fact, to cover up uh, our own crimes and sins? Uh, to hang it as a kind of curtain so that we don't have to look at ourselves. That worries me a bit. I worry a bit about um, the kind of moral voice of high moral authority condemning Israel for what it's done and at the same time benefiting from our own heritage uh, of, uh, of, of evil uh, that has continued for an awfully long time and that is actually pretty much exploding in our faces right now with the white supremacists and the ADL mm -hmm. says they've doubled uh, in the past year. So uh, I would say I'm, I'm grateful for the United States. It, uh, it saved my father's life. Had there been a state of Israel, it would have saved 6 million Jewish lives. The United States saved my father, but it didn't save my grandmother and uh, the three aunts of mine who were murdered. So there are uh, there are things that one has to take into consideration. I worry about a liturgy that is concerned with the Nakba and not concerned about Native Americans and about Black Americans and about all the people who are struggling desperately at our southern borders right now because yeah. of the wickedness we have done in Central America that has caused them to flee the violence and the and the poverty. So, in some in some sense, what what it, it's we all focus on one thing because that's all we're capable of but it, that's the danger that we don't see the whole 
picture. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just... and, and uh, um, Brent, you um, as also a member of this congregation, I noticed that there is a lot of kind of deepening of thinking exactly of what uh, Susanna was just mentioning of thinking about uh, white supremacy, slavery, um, and kind of complicity of, um, you know, the <laughs> American complicity, American Jewish complicity as well. So uh, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I know. I just want to finish? make it very, very clear. Yeah, yeah. that I'm uh, not I think it's a mistake to look at the situation in Israel-Palestine in a vacuum, um, yeah, and that it needs to be understood within a context. And you know, in the paper that uh, that Italia shared, um, it include a prayer. It includes a prayer that I wrote, which was a reworking of the Book of Lamentations that was read at a uh, um, at a detention facility in in India, in uh, Illinois um, on on Tisha B'av. So. We, I've developed and we've developed uh, liturgies that far transcend the unique situation um, in Israel-Palestine and understanding that that's really a subset of a larger, uh, a larger system of oppression to have an intersectional approach to this, I think is absolutely um, essential. Um, I think it's a problem often in the American liberal Jewish community that people are uh, progressive except for Palestine, as we often hear. But I think that the opposite is problematic, just as problematic, which is progressive <laughs> only on Palestine. You know, uh, and you can work out those acronyms for yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, but no, I think, Susanna, your point is, is absolutely well taken and essential that we need to be able to understand the situation in Israel-Palestine in the larger context if we're going to be doing this work. Yeah, yeah, I know that we agree about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so um, th there is one, uh, maybe you have time for one final question from Liz Bolton, uh, who writes, um, uh, Dr. Heschel saying there is no divorce between the religious and the political reminds me of my favorite quotation from Rabbi Heschel, prayer is meaningless unless it is subversive, highlighting my feeling that Rabbi Rosen's work deeply reflects both of these message, messages. Kola kavod to both speakers for illuminating the capacity in our tradition to hold and sustain deep challenge and to model the, uh, the embrace of classic texts with contemporary diasporic revisioning. Does Dr. Heschel see a way that the present delegitimizing of anti-Zionist voices or congregations could be addressed and challenged in light of your understanding of the prophetic voice? In other words, could I defend what Brandt is doing? I, this is that was my reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, I think it's very important. I mean, I, I, I would say that one of the important lessons I learned from my father was to be, first of all, I as a Jew should feel at home in every Jewish community and congregation whether it's a Hasidic shtibel or a reform temple at Vespers, what they call Vespers, <laughs> um, or the workman's circle or uh, yeah, wherever, or in, and I do, and it's important for my children that they feel that way as well. I'm not always happy as a woman, but mm -hmm. I would say that, that unhappiness is not limited to an Orthodox synagogue where there is a visible curtain but is felt just as much in a reform context where the curtain is invisible, but nonetheless yeah. present. Mm -hmm. But so I think Brandt, uh, what you're doing uh, and Atalia, what you've written about in your book uh, is very much illustrative of what Santiago Slobodsky calls us to think about in his book, Decolonial Judaism. Uh, how do we in fact understand our Judaism not as a triumphal uh, Judaism, aligned with the powers, but on the contrary, as diasporic and therefore prophetic. Standing in that position where we question, where we challenge, and the issue is, <laughs> in the name of justice, those who may not at first understand or feel comfortable or at home need to ask themselves why, why not? What actually, why do they not feel comfortable with a liturgy that you've written, Brandt, that worries about the horrors that have been experienced by people all over the world, not only our own suffering, but everyone's suffering. My suffering means nothing unless I understand everybody's suffering to come before God with the same plea for relief. There is no such thing as pleading for my own suffering alone. Only mine is significant. 
that's meaningless in religious terms. So uh, I thank you. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. And especially right before Passover. Yes. <laughs> brought us, and I hope, Brant, that what you've written, uh, what you wrote for the Passover Haggadah, the, that would be, I, I'm sure everybody who's listening would love to have a copy. So maybe yes. <laughs> you, you can distribute it. Yeah, I will. I will to all those who registered. And thank you for those profound concluding words, Susanna. Uh, and also with reference to further conversations, just kind of the uh, the brief allusion to kind of the feminist dimension that you you just uh, you just introduced. So it's such a joy to end the conversation, knowing that there are so many more questions to ask, especially in the spirit of Pesach of Passover. So um, uh, please um, <laughs> join me in thanking uh, Professor Heschel and Rabbi Rosen, and thank you for attending. Uh, this event. Great to be with Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Italia. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Brad. Chag <laughs> Sameach.